Okay. Uh, welcome to the uh, November 18th uh, Weathersfield Town Council um, meeting. Uh, would Council Pentelow start us off with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Dolores, uh, attendance, please. Councilor Moore and Bellow. Here. Councilor Flanagan. Here. Councilor Forrest is unable to attend. Councilor Hill. Here. Councilor Mazzarella. Here. Councilor Parker. Here. Pa Councilor Penelo. Here. Deputy Mayor Hurley is unable to attend. And Mayor Ralph. Here. Thank you. Um, we have just one presentation to. Uh, to hear from tonight, it's Bloom Shapiro is here, uh, our auditors. So please go right ahead. Okay. Thank you everyone for having us. Uh, my name is Vanessa Rosito. I'm the engagement partner on the town of Weathersfield Audits. Um, I also have with me Jessica Aniscoff, who's sitting in the audience. Um, she's the manager on the audit and Angela Lombardo, who is the in charge accountant. So I'll do most of the presentation. I'm gonna have Jess come up here and do part of it too, just so you don't get sick of hearing me the whole time. Um, so I did summarize uh, the highlights, I guess, of the audit in this PowerPoint that I printed out for you. I do also have the CAFR with me, so if you do have any specific questions, I can look them up and, and answer them. All right, and I know there's a couple of new people to this process, so please, if you have any questions during the presentation, just interrupt me, okay? Great. All right, um, so just uh, as far as the agenda, I'm just gonna talk about the engagement scope and the reporting. I'm gonna go over some financial highlights and the audit results of the CAFR. Um, CAFR is an acronym for Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, which is your financial statements. Um, we have also performed a state and a federal single audit. Um, Jessica is going to talk about those. And also she's going to talk about the management advisory letter. And then I'll come back up and talk about the required auditors communication from Bloom Shapiro to those charged with governance, and then I'll finish up the presentation to let you guys know about the upcoming GASB pronouncements. Okay, so as far as the engagement scope and reporting, um, the responsibilities are delineated on the third slide. Um, basically, management is responsible for the financial statements. Management is responsible for their fair presentation um, in accordance with US GAAP and also as far as internal control of the town, management is responsible for the design, implementation and maintenance of that internal control so that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. The auditor's responsibility is to express opinions on the financial statements and to plan and perform the audit to provide reasonable assurance about whether the financial statements are free of material misstatement. So that term reasonable assurance means that we are not auditing every transaction of the town. We do utilize risk assessment and materiality to plan our audit. So we're not looking at everything 100%. Okay, moving on to uh, the fourth slide. Um, as far as the engagement scope, we have issued an opinion on the financial statements of the governmental activities, each major fund, and the aggregate remaining fund information in, in accordance with uh, auditing standards generally accepted in the United States of America and also government auditing standards. The federal single audit is performed under uniform guidance as written by the federal government and then the state single audit is performed under um, Connecticut general statute sections. As far as the financial highlights, we've issued an unmodified or a clean opinion on the financial statements which basically means that everything is correctly stated in accordance with the uh, accounting standards. We did not have any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses um, 
in internal control over financial reporting. We do have some suggestions, which we'll go over later. Um, as far as the different sections of the CAFR, um, this is actually, um, I kind of joke, but it's a very interesting document. There's three different sections. So there's an introductory section, so that has a transmittal letter, which kind of tells a little bit about the policies of the town, a little history of the town. Um, the GFOA certificate, so the town submits this document to the National GFOA, which is Government Finance Officers Association. And so the CAFR is reviewed by three or four independent people across the United States. And um, basically the, um, the goal is to get a certificate in excellence in financial reporting. So Weathersfield does have that certificate for the 2018 statement, so you'll see that in the CAFR, and I'm sure that you're submitting this again this year for the certificate. Um, also in the introductory section is a listing of elected officials as of June 30th, 19. Um, and then I think there's also an organization chart in the introductory section. In the financial section of the CAFR, um, there's obviously the financial statements and the notes to the financial statements. The financial statements are presented actually in three different bases of accounting. So there's the full accrual basis of accounting, which is all of the funds of the town aggregated together. Um, all of the long-term assets and long-term liabilities are reported in these financial statements. The second basis of accounting is the fund financial statements, which is the modified accrual basis of accounting. And then there's also a budgetary presentation, which is the budget to actual schedule and the, the variance column. So there's, there's reconciliations um, from one to the other, but just know that it's, it's hard to compare like the equity section from one to the other. So it's um, not the easiest to understand, but again, if you have any questions, just, just let me know. The last section of the CAFR is the statistical section. So this is actually pretty interesting. It's 10 years of information um, on your revenue, your debt, some demographic information, and some operating information. So it's pretty interesting to look at this year compared to 10 years ago or five years ago. So moving on to some financial highlights um, on page six of the presentation. So this is that the first basis of accounting that I talked about, the full accrual basis of accounting. These are all the funds of the town grouped together. Um, so this is basically the balance sheet of all of those funds of the town. Um, so you'll see that the total assets of the town was $212.2 million in 2019 compared to $215 million in 2018. So really pretty... Um, comparable, I'd say the biggest um, difference is the depreciation of your capital assets. So that's why they, it did go down a little bit. Um, the next section is deferred outflows of resources. So this is equivalent to an asset, um, but it's called a deferred outflow of resource. So this is basically um, your pension liability and your OPEB liability. These are deferred amounts that are not expensed, they're expensed over time, so they're in an asset for a, a certain amount of time. As far as your, as your liabilities, um, they did increase slightly from 120 and a half million in 18 to about 122 million in 2019. Um, really, you did have an increase in your pension obligation this year but that, was, um, that also included um, a decrease in your bonds payable and also a little decrease in your OPEB or other post-employment benefit liability. So one kind of negated the, the other. Um, the deferred inflows of resources is also another pension and OPEB amount. And then in total, the net position of the town was $86.6 million in 2019 compared to 85.2 the prior year.
On slide seven, um, this again is still the full accrual basis of accounting. Um, so this ju is just showing all the revenues and expenses of the town. Um, you'll see that the revenues again were very comparable, 121.2 million in 2018 to 119.3 million in 2019. And also the expenses um, went from 121 million down to 118 million. So again, very comparable. On slide eight of the presentation, this is the <coughs> modified accrual basis financial statements. These are the fund financial statements. So presented here are the general fund, the capital projects fund, um, non-major governmental funds, which are the smaller funds of the town aggregated together. Um, so you'll see, I'm just gonna focus on the change in fund balance of these funds. The general funds fund balance increased 1.6 million from 2018 to 2019. Capital projects decreased about 2.8 million. Um, that's really because there were more expenditures in capital projects than revenues. Um, there is you know, a pretty healthy fund balance in that fund. If the capital projects continue, I'm sure there will be bonds that will be issued to pay for those capital projects. And then the non-major governmental funds just had a small increase of about 200,000 from last year. And then lastly, the um, fiduciary funds of the town. Um, the town has two trust funds, a pension trust fund that sets aside assets to pay for the pensioners and then the OPEB trust fund, other post-employment benefits, which pays for the expenses of the retirees of the, of the town. So these trust funds are used to accumulate assets to pay those liabilities. Um, so as far as the contributions for 2019, um, you could see the employer contributions were about 6.1 million for both trust funds. Employee contributions were about 1.6 million. And then the net investment income of both funds was about 5.2 million and the benefits paid were about 9.2 million. So you did have a positive return in the net position from last year to this year. Um, in the pension fund, it was about 1.1 million, and the OPEB trust fund was about 2.5 million. So all good results in those trust funds. And then just some other things of note on slide 10, as far as your tax collection rate, the 2019 uh, collections on the current grand list were 99.16% compared to 99.13%. So a little bit of an increase this year. Um, I did include the references in the CAFR of, of where you can find this information. On a budgetary basis, general fund budgetary revenues came in one and a half million dollars greater than budget and then the expenditures were $32,000 less than budget. Does anybody have any questions on any of those amounts or statements? If I could just say, um, if you're going to, if we're going to present the audit in this format in the future, it might be helpful if we have the slides in a PowerPoint presentation so people in the audience and at home can understand what we're going, what we're doing and seeing, um, because I know it's difficult for people in the audience to keep up when we're referring to slides that they're unable to see. So okay, just for sure. the future, um, because we're not doing this in committee, if we continue this format, it may be helpful to have. Um, a PowerPoint presentation. Absolutely, we could do yeah. that. Yep. Thank you, appreciate yep. that. Yep. And uh, to follow up on that, does either Mike or Gary, the town manager, have copies of this that we could provide for public if they wanted to take a look and go through it? Yeah, they... Well, no, uh, not right now, but, you know, if people have questions in the future on it, yeah. Yep. Okay. And actually, maybe we do have digital version as well, so... Yeah. Um, 
something could be posted online sure. for we those could do who that want next to time. do. Sure. Apologies okay. for that. Okay. It's a different format, so yeah, not, you know, no, it's, no worries. Yeah, yep, just something to think about for the future. Okay. I'm going to have Jess come up and talk about the single audit and the management letter. Could, I just oh, I'm sorry. One, one quick question, yeah. if I may, regarding the tax collection rate, um, the 99.16 percent. Can you give us kind of some uh, some guidance or some some com comparative? Is, is this customary is this like many other towns is this trending are we like just some i think each town is different obviously it depends on the on the um population of the town um but in actually one of the tables in the CAFR has the collection rate for the past 10 years so you can look while jess is presenting i'll look to see what table it is okay. and then you could look Thank okay you. So I'm going to go over the federal single audit and the state single audit. So along with the audit of the financials, we're required to look, as Vanessa had said, under uniform guidance at any grants that you receive from the federal government and the expenditures that are what actually go on to these statements. We're required to test grants based on a risk assessment um, that we perform each year. And the same thing for the state side. So on the federal single audit, Federal awards expended this year were about 2.9 million. And through our risk assessment, we tested child nutrition and special education. Um, we had clean opinions on compliance. And what that means is for each grant that we tested, we're, we have a list of attributes that we need to test to make sure that the town is following the requirements of the grant. So for both child nutrition and special education, we had no findings for compliance. We did have a control finding under the paid lunch equity for the child nutrition program. And what this is, is there's a calculation that needs to be done each year for the lunch price to make sure it is within the required limits that um, is for that grant. The town in the past few years has been lower than that limit. So what you're charging for lunch is lower than the required limit, which is okay. But in that instance, you're required to get a waiver um, the waiver was not obtained, so that is where that finding comes from. We've already talked to the Board of Ed for the 1920 year. The waiver is already there, and the Board of Ed has made the decision not to charge the minimum required by the federal government because there is a positive net position in that fund. So to increase the prices would essentially keep building that fund. So it's okay what the Board of Ed is doing. The waiver just has to be obtained. So we've already talked to the Board of Ed and, and procedures have already been implemented so that doesn't happen in the future. Is there any uh, penalty for going above that minimum $5? I know you said, you know. There's, it, I don't think there's a penalty for going. It's a minimum required. You're actually below what the federal government would say that you need to charge. And then would we, and maybe this is a question for the Board of Ed, uh, would we let parents know that, that they are, there's a um, minimum amount for uh, lunch prices, but we are going above that minimum amount because we were below that last time. I think the Board of Ed, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you've stayed where you are with the prices okay. because there's no, they don't feel there's any reason to increase the price above Good. that minimum threshold. Good. Um, okay. If the fund goes into a negative net position in the future, then the prices may increase, but for right now, um, they're staying where they are based on the position in that fund. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so that's the federal single audit. On the state side, they're very similar reports. If you actually look at, um, I believe you have copies of them both. They're, they're laid out in the same format. On the state single audit, the state awards expended was about $14 million this year. And the programs that we tested this year was the Town Aid Road, the Ports, Harbors, and Marinas, and the Open Choice programs. And of those programs, there were no compliance findings and no control findings. So it was um, clean reports for the <coughs> state and then just the one item on the federal. Any questions on the single audits? Okay, so the second thing I'm gonna go over is the management letter. Um, and as Vanessa had said earlier, there's kind of three levels um, of reporting we can have for findings. There's material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, and then there's 
what's considered like the lowest level or, or a recommendation letter. So the items that we have in this letter are our best practices. It doesn't change any of our opinions over anything that we've presented today. It's just a best practice for the town. Um, I also want to point out there's no new findings this year. I'll go over them because I know there's a lot of newer members. Um, but there's no new findings. These have been in here for a few years and the town has been working on um, getting these out of the letter. So the first one is the accounting procedures manual. And we do give this recommendation a lot. It's, it's a best practice to have all of the um, procedures of the town outline if there's ever um, somebody leaves or a medical issue or some reason that somebody, you know, Mike or um, can't perform his duties, somebody else could step in and help. So we recommend that an accounting procedures manual be put in place so that anybody can kind of pick up where somebody left off if something happened. Um, the town is currently in the process of the accounting procedures manual for the 2019 update. So that's been in here for a few years and they're still working on that. The second thing is the fraud tip line. And again, this is a best practice. A lot of um, fraud is found through tips. So we've been making this recommendation to our clients for several years. There should be a way to anon anonymously report something where um, if a citizen or somebody within the, the town feels that there's something going on that they can report it without obviously um, it coming back to them. So we recommend that the town have a fraud tip line. Um, and again, the town is currently working on this with their human resource department. The next item is the financial management system security. So periodically, our consulting group comes in and we have some IT specialists that look through the town's system and make recommendations, again, based on best practices. Um, if they found something that we thought would be a risky area for the audit, we may do additional procedures in that area. Um, the items that are listed here are from when they last came into the town, which was the June 30th, 2014 audit. Um, and I don't know if you guys have this letter, if you want me to read these, but laptop computers used should be encrypted for additional security. Uh, information systems policies are not complete. The disaster recovery plan should be documented. The e-discovery policy should be documented. And a mobile and bring your own device strategy should be incorporated into the town. Um, the town is working on some of these recommendations. Some are awaiting funding. Um, some management is still looking into on how to best implement a procedures to have these comments in theory go away. Um, so again, that's still in progress. Jessica, just real quick, is that for the town and Board of Ed or just the town on that one? When they come in, when our team comes in, they look at both, but you guys are on the same system, right? You have this one person who does IT on both sides. So it, I, separate networks. Okay, so I think these are more, these are the town recommendations. Gotcha, okay. Um, the next one is the non-town cash accounts using the town's federal ID number. Um, we used to have a list of these on here. They were outside organizations that were using the town's number. Um, the town has worked very hard to get them cleaned up. I think the one that is waiting to come off the town is setting themselves up as a 501c3 right now. So once they're set up, then they will come off the towns and use their own number for um, their bank accounts. And the last item is the fraud risk assessment. And again, this is a best practice practice with all of the um, things happening in today's society. Um, for this one, what we're recommending is that the town look at different areas, whether it be cash collections, um, the tax collector's department, or, or anything specific that they're really looked at to make sure that the controls and processes in place are the best they could be to prevent fraud. We don't specifically gear our audit to find fraud. Um, like Vanessa said, we look at, we do a risk assessment, we will look at certain things in certain areas, but we don't do um, look at 100% transactions. This fraud risk assessment could be a t for a specific department or it could be um, for the town's controls to look more into those in depth where we don't go into in the audit. 
And I think that's it for the management letters. Anybody have any questions on any of those? Are, yeah. are these uh, items that you just mentioned, the, uh, we'll call them deficiencies, are they in any kind of priority order? No. Is one more important than another that we should be focusing on? They're, they're not in any priority. They're just listed as things that we found. And like I said, and they've in past years and they're still um, carried forward. Any other questions? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, just first to address the um, question about the percentage of taxes collected. It's on uh, table seven, page 105 of the CAF or so. As I stated, I think each municipality is different depending on the economics of the municipality. Certainly a big city is very different than um, a, a town like Wethersfield. Um, it does seem, I, I would say that the percentage does not fluctuate from year to year that much. So, um, you know, just looking at some prior years, it was 99.22 in 2017, 99.10 in 2016. It was down to 98.79 in 2011. So I think it really just depends on you know, the socioeconomics of the, the citizens of the, of the town. I appreciate that, thank you. Okay, sure. Okay, just to, yeah. I have a question on that same number 10 slide. Oh. Are there any guidelines for the general fund budget above and below, you know, what we, do you I look at, you know, how, how much of a gap there is? Right, I don't think there's any guidelines. Obviously a budget is, you know, a prediction and it's it's hard to predict with the revenues that are going to come in and the expenditures I think it's easier to um, get the expenditures closer to budget than the revenues revenues this you know the state could do something that you didn't think they were going to do um, investment income other income it's it's not as easy to predict as the expenditures so I don't think there's any real measure, I think it's, you know, I know it's a lot of work to put together the budget every year, so I think you just have to try to be as accurate as you can. Okay. All right, so uh, required auditor's communication. So there's, you probably received a two or three page letter. Um, we are required to communicate certain items um, to those charged with governance, I'm just going to summarize um, them. If you have any questions, again, just let me know. Um, so in, note, in the notes to your financial statements, in note one are your significant accounting policies. Um, again, it's, it's a good note to read because it does tell a lot about how um, things are recognized, how revenue is recognized, et cetera. Uh, there were no new accounting policies or no new standards adopted this year. Um, again, I'm going to go into the new GASB standards that are going to have to be implemented in coming years at the end of the presentation. Inherent in all financial statements are estimates. Management estimates a lot of um, amounts. Sometimes they use a third party to help them. Sometimes they just estimate them based on their knowledge. So we are required to talk about these, to look at them a little bit closer during our audit. Um, so um, I'm going to list them here and just talk about them. Uh, the useful lives of capital assets are estimated by management in order to calculate depreciation. Management estimates the allowance for uncollect un uncollectible receivables for taxes receivable. Management utilizes an actuary to calculate your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability. And then also uses a third party to calculate the claims liability for your medical and dental claims and your heart and hypertension. Um, we did not encounter any difficulties in performing our audit. We did not have any disagreements with management. Management did not consult with another accounting firm for a kind of a second opinion, if you will. Um, we are independent of the town of Wethersfield, and there were no uncorrected misstatements. 
So all of the amounts um, in the financial statements, there were nothing, nothing was uncorrected, if you will. Okay, and then as far as the GASB standards, um, the GASB has been very busy writing standards, so there's a lot um, to contemplate for future years, fortunately, unfortunately, no matter how, however you want to look at it. So next year for fiscal year June 30th, 2020, we have two statements, one that is going to impact the town. It's uh, GASB Statement 84, which is fiduciary activities. So it changes the definition of a fiduciary activity. So we're gonna have to look at the funds of the town to make sure they still meet the defini definition of a fiduciary activity and or look at some of maybe the special revenue funds of the town to see if they are a fiduciary activity. In addition, if the town has a defined contribution plan wh for which the town is contributing money, right now that plan, that fund is not required to be in the financial statements but with this new standard, it will be. The second GASB standard is majority equity interests. I feel like this applies more towards like a quasi-government organization. So if, if an organization owns an equity interest in another organization, that's what this statement is about. I don't think it's going to apply to the town. Uh, implementation year 2021, we have another big standard, Statement 87, which is leases. So um, the GASB is implementing the standard for governments. The FASB is also implementing the standard for commercial companies. So you might have heard of this already, I'm not sure. Basically what this standard does is it takes all of the operating leases of the town. So things that you are paying rent for or collecting rent, you know, if you're renting space or um, what have you, um, in an arrangement that is over a year long, you're going to have to account for this just like you would a capital lease. So there's no more just rent expense or rent income. We're gonna have to capitalize the asset and record a liability. So in January, We'll be sitting down with Mike um, and the Board of Ed to go over these two standards, the fiduciary activity standard and the lease standard, just to kind of get ahead of things so they don't kind of creep up on us. Um, also for implementation year 2021 is accounting for interest costs before the end of a construction period. So this standard basically says that you cannot capitalize interest on debt on a in a construction period. So um, some towns are doing this, some aren't. So this standard does not allow that anymore. And then lastly, statement 91, which is um, year 2022, um, has to do with conduit debt. So this is debt issued um, for another entity. Weathersfield doesn't have any of that uh, currently. So we won't have to worry about that one. And that is all I have. Any other questions for me? Questions? Any questions? No? Okay. I think you're good. Okay, great. Thanks. And then I th think you guys are going to stick around we for are. executive session afterwards. Okay. Mayor Rell, as a courtesy to our um, finance director and our board of ed staff, would we be able to move that executive session to this part of the meeting so that we can allow our town and board of ed staff to go home i don't see a problem with it i was kind of hoping we not much going on on the uh agenda but um you know if i'll leave it defer it up to you guys if you want to take a brief recess we can go through some of the uh um comments with the uh, uh auditors and then get everybody out of here pretty quickly i'd be happy to make a motion to move the item B8 executive session out of order to allow to enter it at this time. Second. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Okay.
Um, and may I also say that in the past, the Board of Ed members have been invited. I see um, Board Member Bobby Granado in the audience. Um, I don't know if it is at your pleasure to have her in the executive session as well. She was Board Chair when she was, when this was uh, being audited, so perfect. Thank you, I appreciate that.
Mike. Your wife thank you, Martin Matt. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I would too. Thank you, guys. Um, Um, we'll get back to uh, the council meeting. Um, do we have to re-adjourn or re- No, uh, just start. Okay. Um, so we will uh, begin public comments tonight. Um, if there's anybody who wants to speak. Gus? <coughs> and before Gus starts, we will abide by the five minute rule, um, but I will give a little bit of latitude. If you can start to wrap it up when you get close to five minutes, I won't have a hard fast deadline of wrapping up. I think that we're back to it working up there. Uh, five minutes. Yeah. I guess when I start, yeah. probably the time is gonna start too, I don't know. Yep. I don't see it yet, but you know. Yeah. Okay, when it's okay. Uh, good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue, and uh, congratulations to all of you, I guess, you know, welcome. It's kind of nice to see a lot of new people. I don't know what it shows, probably that uh, the previous council was not really doing their jobs. That's why we have so many new people. And uh, I also feel bad that uh, basically for the older council, they've heard me before. So I'm going to complain again about Morrison Avenue. It's been 10 years. I don't even know where to start anymore, but uh, Morrison Avenue and Hillcrest Avenue are, are parallel roads. They connect Silas Dean and Walker Hill. Morrison Avenue and Hillcrest Avenue is connected by Orchard. Guess what, on the Orchard side, on the Orchard and Hillside, and Hillcrest Avenue, they have three stop signs. This is for the new council. Morrison Avenue and, and Orchard has two. And as a result of that, we have twice as many cars on a daily basis than Hillcrest Avenue. Matter of fact, as measured by the town years ago, Morrison Avenue has 730 cars per day. Can you imagine that? Hillcrest Avenue is 365. You have to ask yourself why. They are parallel to each other, a few hundred feet to each other. One has like, you know, again, 730 cars, the other one 365. I talk to everybody that goes by, that stops by or that walks by. And a lot of times I've heard the reason we go down this way, Morrison Avenue, and not Hillcrest, because there is a stop sign on Hillcrest Avenue. Why? Morrison Avenue, before 1955, did not connect to Silas Dean. It was a dead end street. Matter of fact, Tifton was supposed to connect to Church right here. That was never done, for whatever reason. Morrison Avenue was built like, you know, as a neighborhood, a little one. Matter of fact, the frontage setback for Morrison Avenue is completely different than the frontage setback for Hillcrest. One has to ask themselves why. The right of way for Morrison Avenue, it's a, it's a 50 foot right of way, the existing for the road right of way. For Hillcrest Avenue, it's 80 feet. You have to ask why. And it's not because we don't have the depth on, this, you know, on these lots. My lot is 185 feet, and my house is sitting next to the, the sidewalk, I guess. Again, I really believe that the way Morrison Avenue was built and constructed was never meant to connect it to Silas Dean. I mean, before 1955, there was no, not even an existing right of way connected to Silas Dean. Why did they ever do it? In addition to that, what we have more than Hillcrest Avenue is Tifton. So in actuality, before the reconstruction, sight line distance was not a problem. Right now, because they did an atrocious job, a lousy job, there is a problem with the intersection sight distance when you come out of 
Tipton. You look up Morrison Avenue, you cannot see very much. And one of these days, something is going to happen. And yes, I think we have to be proactive. We do not have to be reactive. Something is going to happen. It's too freaking late by then. 59 seconds. <laughs> so what am I trying to say? That the construction of, of uh, the sidewalks and making the roadway which was 30 feet wide to 24 has created an intersectional site problem on Tifton and Morrison Avenue. The intersection site distance for Tifton and Morrison Avenue, it's only good for about 24 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25, and people go about 32 miles per hour. The 85th percentile is 32 miles per hour. And I really believe that something needs to be done before something bad happens. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else wants to speak? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Congratulations to all, all you folks um, that won this election. Uh, a, quite a turnaround and, all, and a lot of new faces, faces I've never seen before. So I uh, wish you luck. I also want to give you some advice. The Republican Party has been a party that only has maintained itself as a majority like in four year or two year segments, two, two, two year segments, and then they end up losing because they assimilate too much with the Democratic Party. They go neck and neck with them, and then they end up losing by, by gathering or trying to get their supporters, and then they end up losing. My advice is find Find the way that's your way, and your way, really, from what I've read in the, 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 uh, the Weathersfield Life, most of you, if not all of you, spoke about we have high taxes. And I agree with that. And I would stay on that to uh, find a way to reduce our taxes. For instance, my taxes this year went up $590. That's seven percent. We had Mr. Forrest, who's not here tonight, argue that the average citizen, or re I should say, property, would only go up seven dollars. But mine went up five hundred and ninety dollars. That's tremendous. And this was in a year that we had re-evaluation. Re-evaluation should have pushed our grand list up and and dropped our mill rate. But it didn't. They didn't because they, they spent like drunken sailors for years and didn't care because they had the votes. Now, you people beat them. And the only way, folks, you're going to beat them back and keep up here is to do something about taxes. Taxes and the dark days of Weathersfield that we've had. Hopefully, you'll open up the skies. Like I say, most of you folks all spoke about taxes, and I would be really, really lean on that. Now, the new mayor, I've read some articles. Uh, he says that the town of Wethersfield has a revenue and a spending problem. I don't know what newspaper I read that in, but when you think about the what, what Weathersfield has done over the last number of years under the last regime, they've given out tax abatements. That means we don't collect taxes on those properties for a number of years. I guess that's called a revenue problem. And we have several of those. We also have other revenue problems, such as our town council has given out like a 50-year lease to the Standish House down in Old Weathersfield to the Weathersfield Historic Society. A 50-year lease at $100 a year. 
They did that on two properties, Standish House and the Kinney Center. And if the Weathersfield Historic Society spends anything over $3,000, the town is responsible for all the other money. So that's a revenue, that's, a, that's not a spending, that's a revenue problem we have that's been addressed many times from this podium and never handled once. Now, ten, there's a 50-year lease, and every 10 years, the town of Weathersfield can renegotiate that lease. And I would suggest you folks look into that and get it on the, on the Gantt chart because you want to be ready to take it on. Now, there's also another thing. My understanding is public, I should say public owned property, such as property owned by the towns, that is put into commercial, prop, uh, commercial use. I'm hearing, and I've never read the law, but it's eligible for tax, real estate taxes. And I would hope that someone would look into that. So think of your Gantt chart again. That's, that, if that can happen, because they rent it out to Lucky Lou, they collect 43,000, the last I knew, per year. And we take, and we, and we only get $100. <laughs> and they get, and, and, and we carry the expenses over $1,000. We should get at least a tax on that property from the Weathersfield Historical Society if we can't break the lease or if we can't do anything with the lease until we get to that next 10 year period. Then you gotta, you gotta do something at that 10 year period and act. I presented that to the former mayor and nothing happened. And everybody knew about it and you know how it is. So there, there's a situation where we have lost revenue just like the, re, the, the abatements that we have. And, and, and that goes along with the historic, well, that goes along, yes, I understand. And that goes along with the Kinney Center. The Kinney Center now, from what I've, when I drive by, I also see a sign, the Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce. So if, they're, if that's a now becoming a public rented property, we should be looking into that. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have loads of things to talk about, okay? We, we've, had such, every... we've had such a lousy government for so long that has ignored the citizens and they just kept taking care of their friends and their buddies. And we don't need that anymore. That okay. has to stop. If you want to get reelected four years from now, six years from now, eight years from now, thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, and we do have public comment at the end as well. So um, we can hear from people for the second time. Anybody else, Mr. Crook? Good evening, uh, Rocky Karuk. Uh, by the way, I haven't been here in a while, and uh, uh, I've been here the first time Gus mentioned the stop sign, and I, I, a couple times I supported him, a couple of times I didn't. But uh, I, I kind of told him it's kind of a lost cause, but he, he doesn't want to give up. <coughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, well, a little bit surprised, but I'm really, uh, I congratulate you guys for being reelected. I'm, I'm really surprised the Republicans uh, took such a large majority. But I always thought, uh, Mr. Rell, that uh, Mayor Rell, I thought that you would eventually be mayor. I thought, well, you almost got mayor first time, but uh, Republicans didn't have a majority, so that's why you were mayor. But um, and I heard the uh, the word governor come up a couple of times. I don't know, maybe possibility in the future. I, I know Bronin is interested in mayor and governor, uh, governor. So maybe you two would go heads to head against each other one day. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. But um, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't come here that much. Uh, I was a, a regular public comment speaker, just like Gus and Robert. But then I just did not much to talk about nowadays. You know, except for the MDC. I think that was one of the last times I talked about it. I, I, I've never been too happy. I talked about the MDC back when, when the Cove was a big issue and they didn't want to do anything about it. And they, they just wanted to put up these holding tanks and it was, it was the best. And, uh, and now the cost is still too high. And I, I did mention last time I was here, I did speak to someone from the MDC and I said, really, the only way to, to cut down the cost is to extend the, uh, the payments and the, and the, and the construction 
over a longer period of time. Sort of like a, like having a mortgage. If you can't afford a 15-year mortgage, you get a 30-year mortgage. You know, spread it out. And and that, and I spoke to someone from the MDC, and he said, "Well, that that's he agreed with me. You know, that's really the only way. You know, the, the uh, but also the possibility of grants." And that's one thing I also something I heard about that uh, I thought might be a possibility, and I guess it is a possibility. That, so if we kind of wait out a little bit for maybe some grants, then uh, I don't know federal or state grants, then maybe uh, that that could help us a lot. But once we pay the money, we're not going to get the money back. And uh, but I I do think if you want to uh, do something about the payments, we just got to negotiate the 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 length of time. That we, that we do this this these sewer work and uh, and, and pay them for it because it's it just uh, just too high, but um, besides that I really don't have much to say. Uh, I'm really proud of you, proud of you guys. I, I I know Tyler Flannett. Well, I don't really know him. My daughter knows him. I, she went to high school with him, so I think they're around the same age. I don't know. My daughter's 21. I, I don't know if you're 20, but 21. But um, so uh, so I'm, I'm happy to see all you guys up there, and uh, uh, I'll probably be back. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? If not, okay. Um, I'll move right into council reports. Um, I guess most of us are new, or most of you guys are new. I don't know. People haven't been going to council or um, committee meetings, but uh, if you guys have anything to report for um, council fellow. No, I don't have any reports. I have some comments when it's appropriate. Okay. Um, yep, I, no council reports. Then council comments. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I do hope that we will see the blight ordinance come before council um, in the near future. The town staff has put considerable uh, time and effort into updating it. It will help um, our staff go out and um, enforce some regulations on blighted properties and on some vacant properties. So I hope that that uh, will come to the come before this council. Um, I'd recommend that Councillor Flanagan resign from the boards and commissions he's currently serving on. It's because um, as an elected official, you should not be on boards and commissions as well. Um, and then I encourage the Newtown Council to support two large events that have been proposed for summer 2020 in Weathersfield the Colonel Chester Fife and Drum Corps 70th anniversary with the National Muster, and also a work camp that we were um, beginning discussions with Pastor Willard on. Um, both of these events will bring large numbers of people from outside the area to our community, but they will also require town services, use of town buildings and facilities, and will have a cost. Um, but I do hope that we can support them. And then finally, um, I just want to thank residents and our first responders um, for the food drive that was held this weekend. Um, we do have um, people in our community that um, do need some help, and so I'm happy to see so many people give to our Thanksgiving food drive in town. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, there, um, I'll follow up with my uh, you know, comments as well. I was going to say something about the first responders but thank you uh counselor uh bellow for that uh, i do want to talk about uh weathersfield is fortunate enough that we do have a leaf pickup program in um in town the first wave for the first cycle of leaf pickups has been completed i believe the second one uh has been completed or well the second go around um is just starting for that um, um areas which are on the, the town website, you can see exactly where they will be going and what dates they are, but this is the second round of pickups going on right now. Um, before it gets too cold, I guess get your leaves out to your curbs. Um, speaking of cold, it is ho holiday season coming up, and uh, you know it was mentioned about the first responders yesterday at Stop and Shop on the Berlin Turnpike. The DeSopo Funeral Home is also having a Thanksgiving drive this coming Saturday at their place, 277 Folly Brook Boulevard. Uh, turkeys, um, you know, um, canned foods, as well as monetary donations are greatly accepted for those guys. We do thank them for that. Um, it is holiday season, and along those same lines, um, Holidays on Main is coming up December 5th, 5 to 9, in uh, Old Weathersfield on Main Street. 
Uh, Colonel Chester, he had mentioned the uh, fife and drum, will be there. There will be wine tasting, uh, a beer garden, as well as um, crafts. A visit by Santa and you know, the all-time favorite of everybody in Old Weathersfield, the horse-drawn wagon rides for families or for adults if you want to do it. Uh, we'll be going throughout uh, Old Weathersfield. And then finally, uh, speaking of Old Weathersfield, we have become pretty much the Hollywood East of um, movie productions with uh, um, Christmas on Honeysuckle Lane last year. This year it is Rediscovering Christmas, which um, was filmed right here in Weathersfield. Um, I probably have to do a little bit of research, but I'm hoping that we get either a little bit of revenue out of it or um, definitely our shops, um, both on Salestine Highway and Old Weathersfield, take advantage of the movie production crews as well as the uh, influx of people coming to take a look at what's going on. Um, it is a home run for uh, not only uh, Old Weathersfield, but all of Weathersfield to have um, that activity down there. It is going to be on Lifetime Channel, I've been told, uh, December 15th, 8 p.m. as well. I believe the Historical Society will be streaming it live uh, or streaming it um, at the Keeney Center as well. So a little something good about Weathersfield right there. Town Manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I, too, was going to mention the first responders, um, so I'll add a little anecdotal uh, note to that. Uh, we had a volunteer who had spent a number of years uh, working for that particular food drive who uh, enlisted in the Air Force, and she was able to, at the last minute, convince a number of individuals at her base to take up a collection. And she delivered that collection today, probably about five shopping carts full, and it was a surprise and completely unexpected. And, um, I do appreciate town staff, uh, the emergency responders, as well as staff who went out to help on the volunteer over the weekend um, on their own time, as well as um, the staff that gathered today to help unload the food trucks to bring uh, information, um, bring the food in. Uh, with that, uh, staff and I have begun meeting with uh, to discuss capital improvement plan projects for the upcoming year. We're trying to get a jump start on that as early as possible that, so that we could start to organize and hone in on what are those top capital improvement projects. Um, in this way, we can take a look at long-range plans, funding, and funding needs going forward. This is my first full budget cycle with the group. I came in in March of last year, so um, I got to jump in right into the middle of the mess of... Um, the messaging that was already being put out. Uh, I've been spending some time with the town manager of Rocky Hill in Newington. We're looking to expand that group slightly, but we're really looking at different regional funding opportunities and potential cost savings that we could bring into the region as a whole, whether that's sharing equipment, sharing personnel, or, or just sharing ideas on how to streamline government from one town to another. Um, there looks like in a recent meeting with OPM, uh, there may actually be some funding coming out if the debt diet s loosens up a little bit um, and an opportunity for us to go after some funding to potentially <laughs> offset some costs that we have. I'll keep you informed as I know more. Uh, the town recently, in partnership with the Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce and the Connecticut Green Bank, uh, introduced to about 30 developers, large business owners, large property owners, uh, commercial residential mixes, um, the Connecticut CPACE program. If you're unfamiliar with the program, it provides large property owners, large, uh, whether you're, you're the business there or the actual property owner, some cost savings opportunities that address energy efficiency. Um, they address energy efficiency and looking for opportunities to reduce costs for operation costs. And as I stated at the intro to the meeting, while the town might not have any direct financial benefit that we can give to the business, um, we're looking to always expand our toolbox so that we can play connection and connectivity. Connecticut Green Bank is a uh, quasi-government agency, so uh, I don't have to worry about competition or competitive forces out there. They are kind of the go-to, um, and they'll provide service to, services to our businesses for free. Well, I should be careful how I say that, but they'll provide services to our business uh, to try to analyze where the cost savings may be before they move forward. So it's an opportunity for an existing business uh, to really look at how they reduce their costs so that Weathersfield is more competitive and bringing in businesses and stabilizing the businesses that are currently here. Um, so as part of that, uh, part of that special thanks to Town Planner and Director of Economic Development, Peter Gillespie, 
who put it together, as well as Leslie Civitello from the Wethersfield Chamber of Commerce. Uh, on November 13th, the town hosted its second old Wethersfield parking study. There were about 20 to 30 residents or business owners that were in the audience. Number of great ideas brought forward as we we're analyzing what we had for available parking in the downtown, and uh, the downtown, and well, downtown old Wethersfield. It's kind of quaint. Um, there was a very lively discussion about balancing the needs of residents as well as uh, the needs for businesses operating in the area. Uh, that understanding that you really need a balance of um, of the businesses to support not only the residents living there but also the tax base as a whole. That they are a part and an important role in our tax base. Uh, the next meeting will be sc is scheduled for December 4th at 7 p.m., and I invite the council and residents to attend as well. Um, and just on a note, we will, as a reminder, we will be closed on Thanksgiving, November 28th, as well at, which is a Thursday, as well as Friday the 29th. And that's all I have. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, we move into council action. Uh, looks like, oh, sorry, Dolores. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes, what we have is that um, we have finished uh, select, uh, sending everything into the state of Connecticut for the uh, elections. And we had different reports to have done from our office and the registrars had different ones. So they've been completed. Okay. Okay, thank you. We can move into council action now. Um, we do have one, um, I, uh, actually two items for this side, acceptance or reg, uh, resignations from boards of commissions. I make a motion to accept the following resignations, uh, three of them. Inland Wetlands and Conservation Commission, effective 10 27 19, Roger Masillo, 100 Meadowview Drive, uh, term 9 5 17 to 6 30 20. And also resignations from the Youth Advisory Board, effective 11 15 19. Tyler Flanagan, 1900 Hunter's Path, a term of 7119 to 63022. And also from the Volunteer Firefighters Pension Committee, uh, effective 111519, Tyler Flanagan, 19 Hunter's Path, term 7119 to 63021. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments, questions? Okay, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it, motion's adopted. And then we have another. Yes, I'd like to make a motion um, for the resignation of Lee Seekus, 117 Wells Road, Unit 13, from the Weathersfield Advisory Commission for People with Disabilities, effective 11 15 19. Second. Um, I'll make a quick comment about Lee Sikas. Uh, I've worked with Lee uh, a number of times on um, both the Memorial Day Parade and the 375th Parade Committee. Lee is a dedicated member of our community who has um, given a lot to uh, this community. And um, it's gonna be a shame to see him leave the uh, um, Committee for Peoples with Disabilities. He's been a strong advocate for that. Um, I have covered those committees uh, once or twice in the absence of some council members, and he has always been a very good vocal uh, proponent for what to uh, do for Weathersfield's um, um, his, uh, dis disabled community. Um, sorry to see him go. Uh, motion on the table to uh, accept that resignation. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion's adopted. Thank you. There's no appointments, no approval ordinances or uh, resolutions tonight, unfinished business. And it looks like um, we can go right into approval of minutes from the October 21st, 2019 meeting. Um, we may be the only ones, Councillor Bellow, to 
have been privy to that meeting. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the October 21st meeting. Okay, I'll second that. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Abstain. Ayes have it. Thank you. I will just announce that you have uh, attached to them is the um, MDC report on their budget, in case you didn't realize that. Right. Yep. Thank you. It's attached to the paper. To I did see that it was 30 some odd pages, and <laughs> I know we are talkers, but <laughs> it didn't go that long on that one. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, we can go back into public comment for the second time. Mr. Colantonio. Good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. This is a new council again. It's beautiful, a lot of it new. I've been complaining about Morrison Avenue for the past 10 years, and uh, does it bother me it's been that long? No. The thing that bothers me the most is that um, I ask a lot of questions, and yet I never get an answer. Matter of fact, regarding Morris and Evan, the only answer I got is that there are too many stop signs in town. We don't want to install anymore. That's sad. Now, if you look around, basically, you see the same people every meeting. Do you ever ask yourself why? When I ask the people, says, why don't we go to the town council meeting tonight? He says, ah, why? It's a waste of time. They don't listen to you. That's what they say. It's true. It's true. Over the years now, I mean, I've learned. I used to look up to people in town, not just this town, every town. I moved to this town in 1973. I said, wow, Weathersfield, coming from a town back home in Italy, where the only reason we came right here is because we could not make a living there. And I'm the first one to say it, you know. And if anybody tells you Italian, tells you otherwise, they're lying. But you know, when I moved to Wethersfield, I felt so good, I says, wow, it's great. Now, 40 years later, we have food drives, and I'm not against food drives, but there are a lot of people that need it. Do you ever ask yourself why they need it? Is it because the taxes are too high? I bought the house, I used to pay $127 mortgage. Now I pay over $600 in taxes alone. There is something going on that it's wrong. And yet, and yet nobody's addressing it. I often say, and I, I love Italy. I've been there many times back, and, uh, and it's beautiful. And a friend of mine goes there and says, Gus, why did you leave Italy? And I says, wow, you know, you got a good point. Italy is beautiful, but you cannot eat beauty. Looking back now, I'm 73 years old, and I look back, I blame the politicians. Now, there. And right here, I start blaming the politicians too. That's crazy. When I graduated from UConn in 1971, I had a choice. Well, I thought I had a choice, but I probably I didn't. You could go to private and make, you know, pretty good money, or you could go in government. Don't make as much money, but the benefits were good. 30, 40 years later, guess what? In private, a similar job pays less. In government, pays more, with more benefits and no accountability. I've said more than once, this is a great country. I've better days and I complain all the time that's the best country in the world. But, uh, we used to, or the, the union made what this country is. Now the unions are destroying this country. They are too selfish. Something needs to be changed, otherwise we become a Venezuela or Iran, you know, all these bad things, because it cannot keep on going like that. Something needs to be done. The taxes alone are not the ones that provide I guess liability, li liability, you know, provides the good stuff for the town. 
you got to reduce somehow the cost because it cannot keep on going up and up and up. What do you know? I, I am on a fixed income. Where is it going to go? A few years down the road, if I cannot pay my taxes, you're going to sell the house from, from under my feet. Is that going to be good? Again, there is a lot of need in this town because of food drives and everything else. But I think you politicians are part uh, to be blamed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. No, just thank you. Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. And Mr. Colantonio is correct about these people having a real tough time um, with the expenses and all. I, I, know, I know for an example where some seniors you know, they get their, their uh, social security check and they get their pension check and uh, the bills come in because I see them. They have, they have to pay for life insurance policy, uh, you know, um, health insurance policy they have to pay for. They've already are on the hook for long-term health care. So those payments got to be made every quarter. And, and you know that's like a thousand dollars coming out of someone uh, for one person for a payment that I've been seeing, and you know they have all these other expenses like like we have, and and it, it is pretty tough when they only have their social security and they have some pension coming in, and it just goes very quickly. But then of course that real estate tax comes in, and like mine, five hundred and ninety dollars extra this year thanks to the people down the end and all the other ones who, who voted for bigger, bigger spending. But anyway, I think first thing, Mr. Mayor, you need to consider uh, extending your five-minute rule uh, to something longer, uh, especially when you have a public attendance like you have here tonight of only five people from the public. You know, I mean, so what if someone gets up here and talks for 10 minutes? Who cares? You, you only have five people and only two of them to spoke tonight. So you might want to consider that. You might want to also consider um, something that's new to the town, probably. It's called transparency, something they don't have here. Uh, when I talk about transparency, and I've talked about it for uh, a number of administrations, because none of them listen, but maybe you folks will, because I think it's very important if you can go online and see the checkbook of this town and see how the money is being spent, see where it's going. How about the payroll? Same idea. How about the Board of Education's budget? Uh, a checkbook put up on, online and see how that is. That, that would be a real eye opener. And of all, they have a thing called the Student Activity Fund, something that is buried. Nobody sees it. And, o and only I have seen it because I've had to do FOIs in order to get the information and then reconstruct it from paper onto a computer into spreadsheets. And I have a number of years showing things that are pretty ugly as far as I'm concerned and they had no business being spent in a, in a student activity account. And I would, I would also consider and urge you, um, you know, we're, we're looking at a recession coming up. And that recession is right around the corner. I don't know when it's going to pop up, but we keep hearing about the economy is slowing down and slowing down. And as that slows down, that's going to affect us. And I would, I would strongly urge you to consider putting some kind of a... Uh, uh, tightening up on your spending right away. Tighten it up because we're going to need we're, we're going to need to cut back. Last at the last recession we didn't cut back. The last recession we kept spending like drunken sailors, and they didn't care for those who were in charge. And and where did our property values go? They didn't go anywhere. They went down, and we're not even there yet. 
since the, the 2008 recession, the 2010 recession, where you haven't even recovered because they, they, they were so, so incompetent, those who were in charge, and they just kept spending and just kept more and more. So I would urge you to consider the fact, and, and you know, Mayor, you talk about the 40 mills. You wait. I mean, if, if, if we had the old administration in here, we'd be at 43, 44 mills this year because there's so much debt that they have loaded onto us. And they were the smartest brains we had in town. But they did that to us. So now you need to turn it around. Maybe we can talk about that at some other time. But in turning it around, we also have property that the Board of Education rents. And I don't recall what the dollars per year were, but they have a transitional academy up the street, which is a private owned property that they spend 50 or $60,000 a year to rent. When in fact, they could have, if they didn't, they could have put it in the, in the basement of this building, the transitional academy, it's on a bus line, and they wouldn't have to pay taxes. They could have put it over in the Kinney Center if they didn't give that property away for $100 a year. But they also rent the room over at the Kinney Center and they pay hundreds of dollars for an event. I mean, the whole thing is totally backwards, but then those are backwards people that we had running the town. Okay. So Mr. now we've got to consider. Just. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I, I, yeah, I'll wrap it up. But we, 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 I believe that there's a number of items out there that we could reduce our costs. We could get rid of that academy location and bring them into somewhere in here. They, they wanted it on a bus line. This place is on a bus line. You know, the Kinney Center is on the bus line. A lot of things to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment? Mr. Lynch. Jim Clinch, 903 Ridge Road. Uh, I want to thank Amy, um, I'm Michael, and uh, Tom for showing up at the uh, Veterans Day ceremony. It was a great day and a great, great ceremony. I also uh, like to uh, pass my thank thanks to uh, Mrs. Griswold from the Park Department. She does a tremendous job. She, um, I, I don't know if people on you notice, but I used to take this uh, older Second World War veteran, uh, probably for the last 30 years, to vet Veterans Day ceremony in Memorial Day. <coughs> and uh, he's now in, he's 102, and he's in a convalescent home. So she gave me a box of cookies. He's down in Old Saybrooks. And she gave me a tray of cookies, and I brought it down to him. He was real thankful for that. So I wish you passed on the message to her. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for your service, Mr. Thank Clinch. You. Okay. Um, I think that's it for public comment. I think our town manager has just one quick comment. If I may, may <clears throat> well. If I may, Mayor, take a moment of um, personal privilege. I just um, want to acknowledge our finance director, Michael O'Neill, who is still in the audience. Um, I thought that was a great audit, um, if there is such a thing. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, it's because of you steering the ship, and I really appreciate the dedication and time that you put in to make sure um, it, it's as clean as it can be. So thank you very much. Yes, I concur, and I think we all can. Um, very well, and uh, the uh, firm Bloom, Sh Bloom Shapiro has uh, um, great respect for the town of Wethersfield, both on the town side and on the Board of Ed side, so I thank you. Without any further ado, and no other comments, uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 aye.
Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Motion or uh, motion adopted. Yeah. <laughs> 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 